today we're going to be speaking about wind provisions. And um, I've given some thought to the title here, and I think we need to redo our title. We are going to talk a little bit about frequently misunderstood wind provisions, but we're also going to talk about some places that maybe our current codes and standards are silent uh, on very commonly encountered conditions, and we'll talk about how to deal with those. So I don't know how to roll that into a catchy uh, title, but maybe clarifying frequently misunderstood uh, wind provisions and providing guidance where our code is silent. So um, hopefully that gives you a little flavor for where we're heading. Uh, we're going to hit on a handful of topics, and as Maria said, we will split it into approximately thirds. Uh, in our four, first third, we will be talking primarily about enclosure classification and analysis methods, um, the former being um, how we classify our buildings, whether they're open, enclosed, or, or partially enclosed. And then the second analysis methods will focus on um, what ways we can generate our wind loads when we're following ASCE 7. Um, there are a lot of opportunities available to us, and we'll talk briefly about those. As Maria mentioned, we'll take a quick break and come back for Q&A. So if you have questions on either of those two topics, feel free to type them in as we go. After our Q&A, we'll do uh, four slightly uh, quicker hitting topics. We'll talk about torsion as it relates to wind. Uh, we'll talk about canopies. Um, we'll do a little bit of some example. We'll do some example problems as it relates to effective wind area. And then we'll touch briefly on rooftop solar or solar PV. Um, solar PV could and should be an entire two-hour session on its own. So we're really just going to dive into some resources, uh, knowing that half the country, this is a really big deal, and half the country um, aren't really dealing with solar at the moment. So we'll do those four topics, uh, and we'll have our second break and then come back with a Q&A. And then we'll finish up with irregular buildings. And this is um, a webinar that I've done as a standalone webinar. What I've done for you is given you the entirety of the content. However, we will not be able to get through all of it. So what we'll do is we'll pick and choose a few of those slides. We'll learn a little bit about how wind flows around a building, and we'll do an example problem. So I have given you more slides than we will be going through in detail, um, but that's intentional, trying to give you some good content to work off of offline. So that being said, we'll go ahead and dive into our first topic. I mentioned it before. It's enclosure classification. And when we do our enclosure classification, historically, we've had three options available to us. Uh, I've shown an agricultural building here um, that's actually in my neck of the woods in the Bay Area. And it's a building that probably is wind controlled, um, very lightweight. And so um, even in seismic country, we have to figure this out. Is this enclosed? Is it partially enclosed? Or is it open? And in order for us to come to a conclusion there, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what those definitions look like. So the first definition, again, these are per ASCE 7. Um, it's uh, an open building. And in order to be an open building, each of our walls need to be at least 80% open. Um, so it doesn't say two of the walls or three of the walls or most of the walls. Each of our walls need to be at least 80% open. So we add up the openings. In this case, my little picture, the three openings. Uh, we divide it by the gross area of that wall, and it needs to be at least 80% open. So that's relatively straightforward. Partially enclosed building is a mouthful, uh, and I actually am not going to go too deep into it yet because I know the initial reaction when you see a, a definition like this is to check out and to say that the wind code is too complicated, and that's going to be something I'm going to push against here today quite, quite hard. Um, but I do want to point to you that this is a two-part definition, um, and the first part of the definition suggests that the total area of openings in a given wall needs to be greater than the sum of the other openings by more than 10%. So what's in needs to be greater than what's out by more than 10%, and we'll dive into that. Uh, and then the second uh, definition has some nuances that I'm going to pass through minimum opening size. Uh, but really the important thing is that um, the balance of our building envelope needs to be less than 20% open. Again, we're going to dive into that deep, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it's two equations that we're trying to measure approximately how open are our walls. And then, as the code often does, um, the way we define an enclosed building, if it's not A and it's not B, then it is C. And unfortunately, most of our buildings are enclosed, and so it's a little bit of a um, disadvantage that we actually have to go through that flowchart process of checking an open building, checking a partially enclosed building. And if we're neither of those, then we qualify as an enclosed enclosed building. And so there's not an actual definition for an enclosed building, but rather one that is not open and not partially enclosed. So that's great. 
Um, that is relatively straightforward if we can convince ourselves to get past the um, nuances of the definitions. Um, but the important thing here is um, what I showed on the screen for an opening had a big X in it. It was very clearly intended to be an opening. And in the buildings that we deal with day in and day out, what constitutes an opening? And we could spend the next 20 minutes on this particular topic. What I'm going to do right now is show you what currently lives in the standard. And then I'm going to give you a little discussion about what's happening in ASCE 722 at the moment.